Um, my name is Dave Loom. I'm a ranger with the Forest Protection Division of the Maine Forest Service. Uh, we're just going to meet tonight for a little bit and talk about logging theft and logging theft prevention. Uh, I work in mostly in northern Penobscot County, a little bit of Washington County. Uh, it's great to see the guest list and see some familiar and some unfamiliar names from from my area and from across the state, both from looks like industry and across the Maine Forest Service. So that's uh, great to see. I'm really appreciative of your of your time and attention. Uh, uh, one note, uh, I think everyone logged in that's going to be here, but uh, I just wanted to remind everyone February 21st, I think that's a Tuesday, February 21st at noon, uh, that's going to be the next event and the topic is tree growth tax law. Uh, I'll repeat that later in case anyone uh, isn't logged in and, and possibly missed that. I'm just going to share a screen here. Can everyone see the see the screen I just shared? You're good. OK, thanks. <clears throat> I'm just going to preface this by saying I'm getting over a cold, so if I need to stop and have a cough or a sip of water for a second, I apologize in advance. <clears throat> So I just really want to emphasize uh, theft from logging operations is, is really a shared problem. Uh, I think it requires our shared knowledge and us working together to address. Uh, so I just want to start by kind of defining the problems that we're seeing from our perspective at the Forest Service, how we're addressing it right now, and uh, most importantly, perhaps uh, what you can do uh, to both prevent this from impacting your operations and your livelihoods, uh, and also assisting us uh, in investigating and, and prosecuting these crimes when they do occur. Um, I, I, just looking across the roster right now, I think if you added up everyone's forestry experience, we have hundreds of years here. So it's a pretty great opportunity to get together and share some knowledge, your experience with this. Um, we'll have a, a good opportunity to do that uh, at the end of the presentation here. So. Uh, I think for the time being, if you have a question uh, and you want to get it out there, just put it in the chat and uh, we can address those a little bit later. So at the Forest Service, we deal pretty frequently with a variety of crimes, uh, criminal mischief, illegal dumping, trespass, uh, various fire related crimes like arson, but really just focused on the issue of, of theft today, uh, specifically that from timber harvesting operations. I don't know if anyone attending has, has had that sort of sinking feeling, you know, coming into a job site, maybe on a Monday morning when you've been away for a little while and maybe you turn the key into your equipment and realize the battery's gone or that fuel gauge seems a little light. So we're, we're talking about really theft of anything from a timber harvesting site. That's most commonly fuel, tools, equipment, firewood, uh, really anything on a site, batteries to ratchet straps. Um, and this stuff is attractive for a number of reasons. It's it's easy to personally use a lot of this equipment uh, or property like fuel. Uh, it's easy to pawn or, or resell it. And uh, we really are seeing that this is increasing. Um, I don't have exact numbers in, in front of me right now. It takes a little while to sort of generate those on a year-over-year -year basis. Um, but certainly anecdotally, it's been my experience in, in my area and uh, talking uh, to folks both from industry and in the Forest Service. Uh, this is an issue right now. Uh, there's recently been a, a string of thefts in northern Maine. Uh, in at least case involving a grapple and some heavy equipment. So this is uh, not a small deal. There's, there's some significant uh, assets and, and values that uh, that are involved here. So uh, it, it's a good question to ask, you know, why is this going on now? I, I think to some degree it's probably related to fuel and energy prices. We've all experienced the, the cost of a lot of things going up over the last couple of years. And I, I think if you think about this from a, a potential thief's perspective, uh, for the, the same amount of effort and risk they might now get two or three times as much value from that same theft versus just a year or two ago. Uh, I, I think also people that are committing these thefts don't necessarily limit themselves to just your job sites. Uh, it's getting increasingly difficult to steal things like catalytic converters uh, with some of that new legislation coming into place. Uh, so that may be another reason why your, your timber harvesting site may be a little more attractive. And uh, there's a lot of items there. Again, you know, they, they are attractive. Uh, it's It's potentially easy for thieves to target these sites, particularly if some of the prevention measures we're going to talk today aren't used. 
Uh, and, and frankly, I think some of these job sites are pretty vulnerable. There's a lot of them all across the landscape, often a lot of high value property. It's often well away from where it can be easily monitored uh, and at the same time, sometimes easy to access. Uh, so I don't, I don't think it's necessarily a secret that these things are out there and it possibly is easy to get away with. And it's also very difficult from our perspective as well um, in terms of prosecuting and, and investigating crimes like this. So we'll discuss that a little bit more in a minute. <clears throat> so this is an issue for us at the Forest Service, um, along with things like fire prevention, fire response. It, it is a, a really a core component of our mission to ensure that you folks that are working hard, making a living in the woods can do so without being impacted by this. Um, yeah, that, and just to prevent this from act, uh, for this activity from uh, impacting the industry, uh, we do work cooperatively with other agencies, state police, sheriff's office on these cases. Um, but we're the only law enforcement agency that that knows this industry. Uh, we know the people, and we're routinely in the areas that you work. Um, and we're also the only agency you're going to see that's specifically performing prevention activities uh, related to this. So uh, I kind of want to start here by just saying, you know, we know we want you to know that we are out addressing this problem, uh, and we have the knowledge and skill uh, needed to do so. Uh, whether that's from professional crime scene processing right through to investigation. Uh, we work all days and hours. We are on call available 24-7, 365, uh, and we're out there engaging with this. So I, I'm a field ranger. Um, myself or someone with my same job title would likely be the one who's showing up at your job site after a theft like this. Uh, like I'm sure is the case for many of you, my office is my truck. So I, I thought it'd be helpful for you to see just as, as far as planning my activities that are related to this issue, what it kind of looks like for me as a, a field ranger. So we document basically 100% of what we do. Uh, on the top left here, you can see um, uh, an, inspe an inspection dashboard essentially that we use to document where we've been, when we were there, what was on site. Uh, we take photos when we do these inspections and, and upload them. And this is all boots on the ground, um, and it's collected in the field using a collection app on our smartphones, and then that's uploaded uh, into this dashboard and then shared among uh, other forest rangers. So we've made some significant improvements in this recently. This is all in real time. Uh, so when I'm when I'm starting a shift, I can look and see what activities have been going on in my area uh, and kind of determine my my day to day activities that way. I, I really try to maintain pretty good communication with industry folks, uh, whether that's just stop it and have a conversation at a, a harvest site or at a mill or with a quick email. Uh, I kind of rely on my knowledge of my local area to direct my activities. So, um, you know, I may be familiar with a contractor who has a certain piece of equipment like a fuel tender or fuel tank or something like that. Uh, and if I know where that's parked from recent activities, I can sort of target that for a little more attention if need be. And uh, it, it's kind of a moving target. Um, you know, certainly weather plays a factor. Uh, workers and contractors move around quite a bit. I know this has been a pretty challenging winter uh, in terms of just the lack of freezing temperatures we've had and contractors moving around pretty frequently. But uh, we do our best to keep pretty good tabs on what's going on in the woods. Um, but this is really a, a two-way street. You know, it benefits us to know where you're at, uh, what you have on site with respect to your theft concerns. So uh, if you have something that's of concern to you, you want, if you want us to pay a site visit, uh, we, we will really will try to be responsible, uh, responsive to that. So uh, just feel free to reach out. So from our perspective, you know, I think it's it's important to just be frank. Um, the reality is that catching violators of this kind is is difficult. Um, some of this is, is just geographic. Uh, there's a lot of land in Maine. There's a lot of harvest going on, and there's a finite number of us out in the woods. We really find that a lot of these thefts occur at night, and particularly during fire season, uh, much of our work takes takes place during the day. Uh, Again, the, the nature of those kind of things that might be potentially found and, and stolen from a timber harvesting site are such that they can be really difficult to track down, like fuel or just everyday items like tools. 
So they're hard cases to investigate and prosecute. Uh, I'll, I'll touch on that again in a little bit. But I, again, I just really want to emphasize tonight that the the word of the night is, is prevention. So um, it's really been my experience that thieves can be incredibly creative. Um, I think we we and you also need to be creative and, and proactive pr to prevent theft. Um, so thinking about this from a practical perspective, in order to steal from you, uh, these folks need to find your site. They need to find and access your equipment wherever it may be in the woods. They need to physically carry off those items. Just really make this difficult at, at every step for them. Uh, criminals are, are pretty rational people in most cases. They're they're just seeking a return on their investment. They're investing some time and some level of risk. Um, and make that difficult, uh, particularly if your site has certain factors. You know, some of the observations we see are um, sites that are particularly vulnerable sometimes have certain things in common, access to roads or visible from roads. If you've got a lot of equipment parked together in a yard, multiple types of equipment, maybe you have a support truck or a trailer with a welder or welding gas, a generator, you know, think about what that looks like to a thief. It's it's convenience, it's opportunity, it's a lot of reward for not a lot of effort. So again, make it hard. Um, you know what? Maybe that means sitting in your truck before you take off for a weekend, or if you're going to be away for a couple of days, and just look at your site like a thief might. Uh, if it looks easy to grab, it it probably is. So, in terms of prevention, you know, I I, I like to think of this as as starting well outside your immediate work area where all your equipment may be. Um, I certainly we would recommend gates. Uh, whether that's installing temporary ones or even locking what's already there. <clears throat> um, another ranger and I were talking earlier today, and uh, as he said, make it annoying to cut a lock. You know, weld a steel tube on that gate and put the padlock inside there so it can't be accessed with an angle grinder or, or bolt cutters quite as easily. Um, I know no one likes to post property. My property isn't posted, but uh, there's also a criminal trespass consideration here. So. Even if you're posting the area to no trespassing right near your site, uh, we may be able to take uh, more action in terms of an arrest, the summons, issuing a trespass warning. Um, it's just a fact that an element of criminal trespass, the crime, is that an area must be posted uh, in a manner likely to come to the attention of intruders, is how the law reads. So um, it, it's, it is in fact not a crime to drive around a harvest site and to be around equipment that doesn't belong to you at 1 a.m. on a Saturday. Uh, it's certainly suspicious. Uh, I doubt people doing that are up to any good, and I may know it. But again, if there's if there's no criminal element present, uh, we're somewhat limited on what we can do. So uh, it might not be the case. Um, it might not be that case if uh, the immediate area around your equipment is posted. So that's not a, a physical barrier, but it may be uh, an important uh, legal one, if that makes sense. Um, I also heard some concerns from a contractor recently that. Um, he felt like his notification posted out the road was uh, kind of like an advertisement, you know, saying, hey, I've got equipment in here. Uh, if you're not already aware, you, you do not you don't have to post your notification out at the road. It's required to be uh, at the primary yard. But if you feel like that's going to be attracting attention, uh, doesn't need to be right out the road. I want to talk about uh, game cameras a little bit. So there, there's all types of these. Um, some of the new ones are really impressive. They use cellular data, cellular data for uh, alerts and images. You can get through an app on your phone in real time, which is pretty cool. They're really a potentially great tool, but th there's a lot of things to think about. Um, one of them is, is that placement matters. You know, it's we, we almost need a, a face of someone in the act of thieving, a license plate. Uh, someone's mere presence is, is usually not enough for a, su a successful investigation. So. And it can be really hard to get that kind of image quality. Um, you maybe experience this on on game cams in the winter when your your shutter speed kind of slows down with the cold weather, and you get those blurry images. Uh, people's license plates are often obscured in the winter, that sort of thing. So just some some general strategies for placement. Um, I, I think about areas of low speed or where someone may need to exit a vehicle, like at a gate, where they're going to be stopped for a moment. Um, 
Uh, I know a lot of people like to put them at, at roads, uh, side roads, right where they leave the highway, so you can kind of capture everyone going in and out of that site. But uh, I'd more consider putting it at the site of the potential crime. You know, again, it's it's not a crime to drive around the woods at night. You might consider putting it on or even inside equipment. Um, I know a couple guys that like to kind of tuck them into a log pile um, right at a primary yard. That might also be a good place to put it as long as it doesn't end up at the chip mill. And uh, game cams are expensive as well, and, and they are themselves sometimes target for theft. Um, I, I sometimes put up a couple. Uh, I've got a, a fake camera that I got for like 20 bucks on Amazon uh, that I sometimes put up kind of as a kind of a decoy, and then I put the real one in a little better hidden spot. And uh, another big thing, if if you're going to have timestamps enabled, just make sure uh, that those are those are correct and they're oriented to the proper uh, date and time. It can be really complicated if they're not. So a little bit of an example of what I'm talking about with game cam. So uh, the one on the right, that's someone who I believe was stealing fuel in Washington County last winter. Uh, that camera was posted on kind of a long straight stretch of road, had great visibility. You could see all the traffic in and out. Uh, but as you can see, it also meant that vehicles could travel kind of quickly on that road. You can see it's 17 degrees in that shot, so the camera's the shutter is moving a little bit slowly. That's why you see that kind of blurring effect with the lenses. So you compare that to an image in the daylight, and that helps too. But uh, camera placement near where a vehicle is likely to stop, where someone may exit to open a gate, to put something in their vehicle. Um, much better placement for a, for a camera. If there isn't a good a good place for a camera, uh, make one. Uh, and, and and putting a temporary gate up is a great way to do that. <clears throat> a couple other things you might consider: um, solar powered or even twelve volt powered uh, security lights with a motion sensor are pretty cheap. Um, uh, really, I, I think maybe the biggest point to emphasize out of all these is dispersing equipment. Uh, so again, you know, think about that thief's perspective. So imagine I've got 100 gallons of diesel to steal potentially among a couple of machines. So if, if I'm interested in removing fuel from your machines, can I pull up to them in your log yard with a pickup truck and pump it all in transfer tank in a few minutes? That's, that's going to look pretty appealing to me. Uh, on the other hand, if I need to walk 200 feet into the woods where you've parked your equipment, and I've got to carry a couple five gallon buckets that weigh 35 pounds each and I'm walking over log and slash and I got to do that 10 times to get the same amount of fuel. It's it's not going to happen. So uh, there are few things that make me happier than me as a ranger having to walk out into the woods to find one of your machines to leave our orange tags on. Uh, if it's if it's hard for me to get to, uh, it's it's hard for a uh, potential thief to as well. Uh, keeping a fuel log is always a good idea as well. Uh, I've, I've seen a couple, uh, I would describe them as partial fuel thefts in my area where they'll take a quarter or half a tank, uh, you know, maybe not quite enough to notice right away, but uh, certainly valuable property anyway. So by keeping a fuel log, you may be able to keep a better eye on uh, what those machines are actually using and, and detecting a theft a little better. We recommend locking everything. Um, I, I think there's probably some disagreement there and, and maybe it's valid. Um, I know some folks say, well, they're just going to cut the lock and then steal it. Uh, but it, it's it's been my experience anyway that really the, the more steps that you are in place to deter and just simply inconvenience people uh, that would be potentially targeting your site, I think the fewer problems you're going to experience. Um, I, I think particularly with some of the fuel theft, thinking about uh, maybe a tractor trailer that's hard to park off in the woods, it's hard to obscure. I, I think in some cases those, those are really crimes of opportunity, like when they're right on a road like that, and maybe someone doesn't have the tools to cut a lock with them. Um, so it, it's still our recommendation to, to lock everything. Uh, and then certainly this is a big one, um, just don't don't leave those. I know those power tools are, you kind of want your, your impact driver handy right there in the cab, but uh, certainly don't leave them visible inside a cab, locked, unlocked, uh, very common target. So looking at that 
photo of power tools at a pawn shop. Um, if you couldn't pick your tools out of a lineup, so to speak, uh, we will not be able to do that either. Um, if there's unique marks or if you've recorded serial numbers, uh, any particular identifying information like that, uh, that's that's really important. You know, if we're putting out a be on the lookout to local pawn shops, if for instance, we need to write a search warrant that needs to be very particular in what we're seeking. That info is is really valuable and it might kind of make or break what we're trying to do here. Um, you know, so just imagine the difference. You know, if I get a, a theft complaint and they said, yeah, they stole a Milwaukee impact driver. I don't know. It was red versus a Milwaukee impact driver. Here's the serial number. Our company name is engraved on the top. We mark all our cordless batteries with a, you know, a dot of orange spray paint or whatever. Uh, that's something that uh, we, we can do something with that. And uh, you know, I would really recommend just have a little caution going into your site, particularly if you're you're coming back after a weekend or some time away or a holiday. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. I had a, a, a theft complaint last year, and what had happened was a contractor had topped off some equipment from his fuel truck on a Friday, so he, he's going to drive it out, refill it over the weekend, come back on Monday, and then use that for the week. So he his site got hit over the weekend. He didn't realize it right away. He drove in on Monday, he, he started work, and didn't really realize what had happened until his equipment ran out of fuel like half an hour into the day. I uh, just hadn't looked at the fuel gauge because, you know, why would you? He just filled it up. And so by that point, if there was tire tracks that had been left over the weekend, he'd likely driven over all of them on the way in. If there's boot tracks or footprints, same deal. Fingerprints, same deal. Uh, there was some power tools that were stolen, but he wasn't sure what. You know, it was unclear if some items were with an employee, were with an employee that should have been left at the site or vice versa. Um, and that was not a successful investigation. Um, you know, so again, imagine the difference if, uh, you know, the call went more like, yeah, this is what was taken roughly when here's a list of what I'm missing. Here's a serial number. We haven't touched anything. We saw these tire tracks going in. We didn't drive over some of them. So, you know, I, I, I want to emphasize, I'm not saying he did anything wrong at all. You know, it, it's a totally reasonable expectation that you can just go to work and not be bothered. Um, but uh, I, I think it's also possible that those days are coming to an end, you know, at least for now. So uh, approaching your site uh, with a healthy level of uh, caution and some skepticism and a close eye for detail uh, might really uh, help you as well as us out. So if this does happen to you, um, one thing I want to clarify is uh, which number to call. If you Google us, you might find a, like an office number in Augusta. That's not the one to call. We are forest rangers are, are dispatched um, by regional communication centers. Aim is the state police, the warden service, Marine Patrol, etc. So there are three of those numbers. Those are the non-emergency numbers for every dispatch center that interacts with us in the state. If you're if you're unsure when you call the last what town you're calling from and, and they'll direct you to the right dispatch center um, if you're not already at it. So. Other than that, just generally avoid disturbing anything if you can, preserving any of the potential evidence uh, that we talked about, and uh, just and kind of getting a jump start and recording any useful information that uh, that might be helpful to us. So that's mostly what I had. Um, that I, I wanted to leave plenty of time for some Q and A. I know there's a lot of knowledgeable folks uh, that may have some experience and, and would like to to share that, some of their best practices, et cetera. Um, I think that's the most I've talked continuously since uh, a couple of years probably. So um, hopefully uh, we got some questions in the chat or if someone else wants to uh, wants to chime in. Hey, David, I'll chime in. Yeah. Hey, this is uh, Regional Ranger Jeff Courier uh, with the Forest Service uh, Central Region. Um, I, I just I think it's important for um, the logging contractors to know that, you know, we're doing we're doing a lot of work here to try and help you help yourselves. Um, it we're we're making 
extra effort to get to your job sites on uh, weekends and uh, nights and holidays when you're not there, because as David said, we we want to make sure that you have a little bit of peace of mind. Um, and uh, one thing I think it's important to know is uh, anytime we we are on one of your uh, jobs and we're walking around even in fresh snow, we're going to leave one of those orange courtesy cards there so you guys have some sense as to who who was in there because I understand it's very unnerving to see uh, unknown tracks uh, around your equipment or at your gate. Um, but again, as David says, one of the one of the greatest things that we I've been talking to contractors about is the use of those portable gates. Uh, you know the the waste the concrete waste block gates with the metal swinging arms. Uh, those those will do wonders, I think, for us in this problem, and I and I hope that people really consider it. I see in the in the chat uh, or in the the group of people, uh, Tony Madden uh, from AW Madden uh, Logging, uh, and he he uses those a lot, and they're very effective. And uh, if if I have to get out and walk into one of his jobs on a on a on a Sunday afternoon, that's that's. Uh, that's a that makes me feel good because that means that everybody else is 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 going to walk too. So we really are pushing those. They're great. You can move them around with a crane. Uh, I think they're helpful. Landowners generally support the use of those too. So anyway, we're we're doing all we can to help. Um, but again, as David said, we also need your uh, guidance on if you feel like you're in an area where it just gives you the the heebie-jeebies and you're not sure. Uh, about the neighborhood or you you have some suspicions or you've seen some some people that might be a little unsavory uh, in your travels around your new logging job, give us a call and we'll put uh, your harvest on a list uh, and the Rangers will check it. I, I promise you that. So just my perspective from uh, from the region, uh, the central region here, and I'm sure there's other people that have other things to say, but we appreciate you, uh, you joining us tonight for sure. Hey, David, I'd like to add one more thing. Yeah. I'm Lance uh, Martin. I'm the district forest ranger for the Allagash district. We've been hit pretty heavy in the uh, northern part of the state. And I just wanted to thank the contractors and the landowners. Uh, we've been throwing out a lot of suggestions to them, and they've really heeded the warning and are implementing those suggestions. And it's helping a great deal, uh, you know, slowing down the theft as well as helping us investigate uh, these crimes. So thank you. To, to the extent that you can, I, I know to some degree it might be an active investigation that you can comment pretty minimally on, but to the extent you can, would you would you mind just kind of sharing a little bit of what's been going on up there? Um, maybe what you see in common with some of the sites that are getting hit, that sort of thing. Sure. Uh, a lot of uh, Batteries, uh, die tools, impacts. Uh, one of the interesting uh, things that happened was uh, the same landowner, three separate gates got hit uh, on the second gate uh, throughout the summer. Uh, the cameras got stolen, but uh, with the uh, knowledge of setting up a second camera, at the third gate, we were able to catch the thieves at uh, cutting the locks. So uh, that's obviously going to court as we speak. But, uh, you know, I, that's why I wanted to thank everybody for starting to implement what we're suggesting, because it makes it a lot easier for us to, to do our homework out there. Uh, another thing, uh, another argument to the locking and not locking thing that we spoke uh, that you spoke about earlier uh, one of the arguments to locking would be that if the, if the item is locked, uh, they're most probably going to leave a little bit more evidence at the site for us to to work with. So uh, that's another argument to locking your stuff up. But it is frustrating. I will tell you on our part when we do a timber asset security check, and we come across on a weekend with nobody around, and you know there's a chainsaw. Uh, a fairly new chainsaw right on a, a log carrier, uh, not locked, you know, right in plain sight. That makes that makes it really tough on us to 
to do our homework. So. Yeah, and absolutely. That's it, David. Yeah, you know, and again, it's, you know, I don't, I hope we're not sounding critical. Uh, you know, I, I aware that for many years, this has just been the way of doing business. And uh, it was fortunate that you just didn't have to worry about this kind of thing. But um, yeah, th those days may be over, at least for the time being. Uh, I'm just checking the chat. I don't see any questions or anything in the chat. Any, anyone else have anything they want to chime in about? Hey, David, this is Dana Duran. Do you mind if I pipe in? Oh, please do. Good to see you. Uh, thank you. Appreciate the, the time you put in tonight and, and for all the Rangers throughout the state uh, and all you're doing. I know you guys are putting in a tremendous amount of extra time with asset security checks across the state. Uh, I've been in touch with, with Robbie and with Jeff going back to early December when we first started to hear of, of fuel thefts and other thefts, and I think you guys have done a a wonderful job and we'll continue to do that we can't thank you enough for the extra time that you're taking to try to to protect the contractors margins are extremely thin uh, out there and folks are getting really really frustrated um you know obviously they hit, got hit by inflation and markets and now this and they're kind of at wit's end and they can't find employees and so anyway that's neither here nor there but um I'll just say I think some of the frustration that's growing with the contractors, it, it, it's not in any way, uh, shape or form directed at, at you folks because you're doing a wonderful job. It's really on the, the law enforcement side of the prosecutorial power of what's happening to folks. And it just appears that, you know, folks that are, are stealing things are getting fined $500, $1,000, and then they're right back to it again. Yeah. So if there's any way to try to continue to work with Maine State Police, uh, local sheriffs, et cetera, to, tr to really try to amp up um, what's happening to some of these folks so word gets around and that these there, there are um, some serious repercussions for their actions. I'm not sure what's going to stop them if all they're doing is getting a fine, but the more that you guys can just make it aware that, that you know, the, the law enforcement agencies are doing something, folks potentially are going to jail, and that this is getting looked at across the state. I mean, I, I just think this is an all hands on deck and it, it can't be, just fall on the Rangers. So whatever we can do to try to get law enforcement more active right now, I, I don't see another way. Um, I know there was an incident in the Enfield area this past Monday morning with one of our members and he kind of took it into his own hands and and unfortunately it, it probably wasn't the right way to handle it but that's just the level of the frustration that's out there right now so anyway thank you for all you guys are doing and appreciate uh, all the work and we'll do whatever we can at, at PLC to spread the word for you thank you appreciate that yeah you're you're certainly speaking to the choir um as far as some of the frustration with uh prosecutorial issues. Uh, a lot of that I think is coming out of the era of COVID uh, when the jails weren't accepting people, everything was getting uh, plaid or bailed out. Um, I, my impression recently, I've been called to court a couple times in the last month uh, for pretty old cases. My, my general impression is that at least uh, from the district attorney side, from the court side, that that backlog is disappearing pretty rapidly. And uh, I'm at least hopeful that, um, you know, there might be some more uh, uh, let's let's call it robust sentences, you know, around some of these uh, some of these crimes, um, and that's you know a point I just want to reemphasize. You know, when we're talking about um, you know all the all these little factors, you know, if you if you post that exact area, uh, if you put up a five dollar lock rather than no lock, and then it's cut, you know that that adds different layers and different levels of, of violation. Um, it, it's often the it's often the case as well. Uh, that certain crimes have aggravating factors uh, if someone has been previously convicted of something. Uh, so that that's a big point, you know, that we want to stress um, is that we really need your help to, to build a good case. Because uh, you're right, it, it is certainly the case that um, some of these folks are just, it's just a revolving door in and out. And the more that we can secure charges um, and, and, and stack those charges up, the more success we're going to have. And again, that may come down to something as simple as, was that area posted at the time that they were there? Did they then commit uh, a criminal trespass? Um, and so on and so forth. So, th so those little details really do matter. Um, uh, but uh, thanks for bringing up that point. It's, uh, it's a, a good one to revisit, certainly. 
David, uh, I see that uh, Tony Madden has his hand up. You might want to give him a chance. Can you, hear, can you hear me, David? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I want to repeat, uh, you know, what Dana said. We really appreciate what the Forest Service is doing. Keep an eye on our equipment for us and nights and weekends. And uh, Jeff is right. We've been we've been dragging around those concrete block gates from job to job for probably 15 years now. And occasionally we get on a job where there's a through way through roads and I can't block off. But well, if you're going to open a gate and drive two or three miles into a job, somebody comes in behind you and catches you in there. It, 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 I think it helps a lot to keep people out. And uh, so uh, anyway, I really want to thank you folks for keeping an eye on our equipment. So. Absolutely. Yeah, and I, I definitely sense the frustration. You know, almost every contractor I talk to has has uh, a, a similar sense of frustration. I, I will say, you know, I, I get frustrated as well, um, but uh, I find a really good antidote to for to that frustration. Maybe really taking it upon yourselves to make it very, very difficult, uh, annoying, hard, whatever uh, for for people to target your site. I, uh, if you're going to do something with that frustration, that's it can be pretty satisfying to direct it that way. Uh, I, I see a hand up, uh, Donald Burr. There we hey, go. David. I couldn't, un I couldn't oh. undo my mic. Sorry. Oh, there you yeah, go. I, I can hear you. Catch up. Uh, quick question. Uh, as far as uh, putting in a, a no trespassing sign, is one sign on a gate sufficient to trip that as a as a an offense? Probably. So the the statute language just says it needs to be posted in a manner reasonably likely to come to the attention of intruders. Uh, so the definition of reasonable being, you know, if if one person versus another are in a similar situation, they both would be likely to see it. Uh, so if, if you can articulate that it is likely to come to someone's attention, uh, you know, I, I think you're certainly there. So if that's a bright orange hardware store uh, sign that says no trespassing and it's it's on a gate at the main point of access, uh, yeah, I think you probably are there. So put it right right next to where the lock is. So they cut the lock, they see the sign. Yeah, uh, if it's a case of a closed gate that's locked, um, yeah, I think you could certainly meet that element of criminal trespass without it being posted. It's you know obvious that it's enclosed in a manner uh, intended to prevent intruders uh, is, is another part of the statute. So in that case, I don't even think it would need to be posted. Okay, thank you. And again, thank you for all that you and the other Rangers are doing. Absolutely. Hey, David, uh, one thing I just want to throw in here, um, you know, like any successful operation or anything that you want to succeed, it's about partnerships. Uh, and we're on behalf of Maine's hardworking loggers and the landowners that support them. Uh, we're reaching out to some of our partners. Uh, case in point, uh, today I attended a, a local law enforcement intelligent meeting where I spoke on this particular issue and there were uh, representatives from uh, the state police, the sheriff's office, MDEA, uh, the warden service, the U.S. Marshal Service, Customs and Border Protection, Immigration, uh, and, and even some Canadian partners. So we're trying to spread the word not just in our own circles and uh, you know with the people that know this is a problem but with people that don't so that you know, a Customs and Border Protection uh, special agent out on patrol in Lambert Lake Township will be aware of this problem too, or, or you know, the trooper or the or the game warden or somebody else. So we're we're trying to expand uh, the knowledge to uh, to our other law enforcement partners across the state, and they're they're hearing it. Excellent. I, I see a question in the chat, which is a good one. Um, can loggers working on others' land post? Uh, off the top of my head, I, I think the statute requires that it's an authorized person. Um, you know, I, I think they probably could. It would certainly be worth checking with the landowner if, if it's not the loggers' land, if they're going to be posting it. Um, so I, I think that's probably the best way to approach that. But uh, that's a good question.
And uh, really just one other thing to add, um, Lieutenant Curry was talking about partnerships and information and um, that, that's really the name of the game here. I, I think it's it's really difficult to run an efficient and effective operation if you don't have good info. So we've on our level, we've really prioritized that over the last couple of years in developing good systems of data collection, uh, making sure that's in as real time a format as possible. So we're getting that information quickly. Um, but that's again, just if I haven't emphasized enough already, that's something that's just tremendously helpful for us. You know, uh, I had an email a couple of weeks ago from uh, a, a forester for a company that I interact with a lot and he just gave me a little rundown you know for the next week uh next week or two you know he said hey we, we've been working in here but the ground's getting soft and we're gonna we're gonna pull up and we're gonna be you know down this road uh for the next couple weeks just so you're aware and after that we're we're going over here and um yeah, that's that's incredibly helpful you know we have uh many different ways of getting information you know whether it's from um our own systems and, and those inspection apps that we record or looking up notifications. But again, it's it's really a moving target. Um, so we, we are highly interested in, in good information uh, such as that. Um, so if uh, if if I'm if you're in Northern Prompscott County, uh, you know, feel free to email me. Uh, I'm, I'm sure other rangers would be equally uh, as eager to hear from you and uh, know where you're going to be working so we can keep a better eye out for you. Anybody else? Well, if there's nothing else, um, if anyone, anyone, no one else wants to jump in with anything or has any further questions, um, we can feel free to wrap it up. Um, I'm going to leave my email address in the chat. Um, if you uh, if you, you are in my area and you want to get in touch, feel free to send me an email. Um, and uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'll stay on for a few minutes if anyone has anything else. Hey, David, I, I think the Chief Ranger uh, was about to chime in there while you were talking, so. Sure. Yes, sir. Hey, hey David, thank you. It, and my apologies, my camera is not working so probably everybody would be happy not to see my face anyway but hey i just wanted to say thank you to everybody uh for for putting this program on but for those who attended most specially uh you know partnerships have been stressed a great deal and i i greatly appreciate the conversation about reaching out to rangers and rangers reaching out to contractors, landowners, loggers, all of the above, because that's really how we solve this problem. You know, it, it's so easy for us not to take the time and energy to not communicate, and communication is really where it starts. Uh, you know, when I was a ranger in, in the field up in northern Maine, I would hear from loggers, contractors alike who were frustrated because they couldn't, you know, get results from people taking fuel or taking their equipment. And and the one thing that, that resonates within our agency is when you call, we will be there. We will be there all the time. And and I think that's a that's a message that we really pride ourselves with. And and really this extends far beyond timber asset security. This extends to, you know, fire prevention and suppression. This extends to helping out with harvests or questions that folks have with timber harvesting. And, and really, as we all know, our forest industry is a small community. We all work very hard for both ourselves, our companies, the state of Maine, and, and really take pride in that a great deal. And so I can't echo enough, communication starts with everybody. And I know I'm proud of the men and women in our agency that hop in the vehicle every day to protect the state of Maine. But likewise, I'm proud to 
to know and work alongside all the contractors and loggers in the state of Maine collectively, mm -hmm. because we really are all out for the same benefit. It's to protect the state of Maine and its way of life. That may sound cliche, but we really take it to heart. So uh, I hope that resonates with everyone. If it's three in the morning, make a phone call. If it's eight o'clock at night, make a phone call. We will do all we can to help. And that message from, you know, our agency top down, bottom up, is is heard and, and messaged every week. And, and it's really part of our core mission. So thanks, Dave, for giving me that opportunity. And uh, certainly, if anyone has any you know, questions, feel free to, to reach out to me. Uh, you can contact me right at the state office. But I know our field folks uh, are real, real receptive and wanting to help. So thanks, Dave. Thank you. All right, well, thanks again, everyone. Uh, again, I'll just I'll stay on for another couple minutes if anyone has anything else, but uh, uh, thanks again for coming.